Hello everyone, my name is John Hammond and welcome back to another YouTube video. Today we're looking at some Hack the Box, showcasing the remote room that retires today. It is an easy, easy, I guess medium, no, easy. <laughs> it's an easy Windows box. I'm just not that good because it's Windows. But I wanted to showcase this, walk through it with you. So here it is, remote, and we have an IP address to work against. It's 10, 10, 10, 180. We can fire up a command line and get to where the good stuff happens. So I'm going to head over to my hack the box folder and I'll make a directory for YouTube remote and hop over there. So we could start with some good practice, actually create a little readme file um, and I will just put in some classic notes. Hello, this is me writing this on the day which is September 45th. <laughs> uh, and here's the IP address of the machine. Let's start off with a classic Rust scan. I'll pipe this into a Rust scan.log, so to tee that and we can see what we're up against. Okay, some ports that are open. We see port 21 for FTP, port 80 for HTTP, 111, I think that's RPC bind. Uh, I always get that maybe wrong or something. 139, 135, 2049. Okay, so maybe some network file share stuff. 5985, that's odd and peculiar. You don't see him all that often. Uh, port 5985, what is that? WinRM? WinRM? Oh. Okay, I mean, it's Windows, that makes sense. Uh, maybe Nmap, yeah, Ruskin will pass it over to Nmap and we'll kind of get a better idea as to what all those things are. Um, but since we have some things to poke at, let me get started with some classic enumeration. I'll do a little Nikto on that guy. T that to get an output file. I'll do the same thing with some GoBuster. HTTP. And I'll use a word list from the default word list that comes from uh, DurBuster. Alrighty, now let's go check out the web page. Welcome to Acme. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Wiley Coyote, genius. I'm not selling anything, nor am I working my way through college. And <laughs> check out our products. Okay, awesome. Uh, a couple of blog posts. Looks like all lorem ipsum text. If I click on any of those, do I get an idea of a username? If this page loads. Nope, no, no username, more lorem ipsum and nonsense. Products. Is that a real link? Yeah, it is. Our gorgeous selection of unicorns, ping pong balls, and a jumpsuit. Okay. Nice, crazy people. Great. Oh, are these real links? Circuit beard? Oh, yeah, these are. Super cool. Great. Uh, let me just click on the source here. Let me hit control U and kind of see what it's built in in the HTML. I see some HTML comments for navigation. Media links, add links to categories. A lot of that to do HTML comment, read links to categories. Scripts umbraco or umbraco. I always pronounce that wrong. I don't know the best way to uh, pronounce it, but that's an indicator that Umbraco might be on here. And if you Google what that is, it is a CMS or content management system. If you haven't heard of it before, uh, I think I've kind of seen it a little bit in other capture flags or training exercises or activities. Let's see what Durbuster or GoBuster's got. Pretty much the same thing as previous and what we've already just seen through the web page. Nikto get anything yet? Nope. Nmap scan is done. Let me try and subble that Rust scan log. And that's gonna have all the gross colors. So uh, if you wanted to, you could less tack R that. And that way you can see the colors there, at least from your terminal. But uh, scrolling through it, just to get a better idea of these ports. Okay, we do have anonymous FTP. We could potentially log in with that. HTTP, yeah, RPC bind stuff. 2049, NFS, network file share. Maybe there's something interesting in that. And that's all it's got for me. Okay. Well, if we have FTP, I guess we could take a look at that. 10, 10, 10, 180 with my FTP client. 
we did see from our nmap scan was that anonymous share or anonymous access was enabled so username will be anonymous and password could just be empty you can whack enter there let's see what we have nothing okay and we can't go any farther than that or explore anything else so that's not helpful fantastic what else did we have we had port 80 which we're looking at and we had the nfs share um I don't see anything else other than that intranet that they're going on. And we didn't actually poke at that intranet page. Is there, is there anything over there? It's still mentioning Umbraco in the CSS here. Umbraco. Someone's going to give me flack. Someone's going <laughs> to someone's gonna hate on me for not knowing how to pronounce that. Does anyone know how to pronounce that? That's the same sort of thing. You're like, how do you pronounce Radar 2? Radare. Radare. I don't know. Red R? GIF, GIF, <laughs> starting the holy wars here. If Umbraco is a thing, is that uh, a location that, like it's a content management system, like the same thing like WordPress might be. So maybe there's a page for that. And my cursory uh, research on it, just for the showcase, content management system, publishing World Wide Web content, Written in C Sharp, deployed on Microsoft stuff. That tracks with me because we're looking at this on a Windows machine. Just doing some quick learning and reading to see. Documentation can be found there. It's open source. Are there any like default locations that it adds? Oh, where's all this? Build. What is this guy? Quick tutorials, creating a basic site. Oh goodness, can I just get to content? When you hit your local host address or whatever you're setting up, you should see welcome to the Umbraco installation screen. And then log into your Umbraco, Umbraco CMS installation on slash Umbraco in your browser. Is that a thing? GoBuster hasn't found that yet. Or Nikto hasn't found that. Maybe we could try some other stuff or like add it into our word list. But if I just simply try to go to Umbraco or Umbraco. Oh, I have a login. <laughs> Happy Funky Friday. Fantastic. A username is usually your email and password. So I can't just try like a classic admin admin or like a stupid stupid little SQL injection. Will that get me anywhere? Ooh, does that reflect out what I have in there? Can I do like some cross-site scripting? Hello. Please sub. That's a better one. That's a better one to throw in here. Please sub. Slap that in. Nah, okay. Whatever. Okay. We know though that there is a login here. And we could do some other enumeration because there are still some other ports that we haven't looked at yet. Taking a look at this, we know we have 21 was a dead end, 80 was the web page, obviously, and 2049, NFS or network file share. So if you guys aren't familiar with uh, mounting and looking at machines that have NFS shares, typically you can start with just a show mount command and TAC E will... Uh, Show mount. What does the tacky actually do? Oh, if you like kind of the colors that I'm using within uh, batch, or excuse me, <laughs> within bash uh, in my Linux command line, I'm using Batman or Bat, some of the shell extensions that come with the Bat uh, package. Tacky and exports will show the NFS servers export list. So the same way that I'm looking at like cat, um, if I cat out my readme, it has kind of nice color stuff. So if you're interested, go ahead and take a look at that. Anyway, Show mount, tack E on our server here, 10, 10, 10, 180, and they have a site backups that everyone could access. Ooh, can I try and mount that? I'm gonna make a temporary directory that just matches the same thing. Ooh, with a incredible typo. Dope. Make directory backups, and I already have one of those, so. 
I'll recreate it for the sake of video. <laughs> uh, and, and then let's go ahead and try and mount to it. So you can mount TACT NFS. So mount specifying the type network file share. And then what you actually want to mount. So you're going to specify the share with the IP address and a colon. And then you can just specify the share that you're actually looking for. So in this case, it's site backups as we got that from show mount. And then you need the location as to where you're actually going to put it. So I'll put it in that temporary directory site backups that I created. And you do need root privileges to do that. So whack a little sudo on there. And there we go. Okay. Let's hop over there to site backups. And we got a lot of stuff. Ooh, Umbraco client. Umbraco. I'm just going to like <laughs> permutate all the potential possibilities of me saying that. And let's run like a find on here to see like everything that's in here. And I'll put it in my location where I'm working on this. I'll put it in my notes like uh, NFS listing dot text. See what we get. Or anything. Is find not going to like buffer that or showcase that for me. Oh, no, now there's stuff happening. What do we got in here? So what we could do is we could kind of trim this down, open it in like Sublime Text or an editor and just kind of like remove the things that we know that we don't care about. That could kind of help us look for interesting things and prune for the potentially peculiar uh, stuff that we might be able to find some valuable and juicy information with. Because a lot of the stuff like, okay, Google Maps pictures, we probably don't care about. Um, same thing with like, I don't know, views. Oh, and there is some of the binary stuff for Umbraco. Config files will probably be useful for us because maybe there's some more information as to how this thing is actually being put together. Yeah, CSS files, though, we don't need to care about. Media files, images, and there's a ton of assets and fonts in Obreco that we probably don't care about. Blah, blah, blah. JavaScript files, Angular. Yeah, okay. A lot more JavaScript, tiny MCE, or some code editing. Settings, views, settings. Mm, ASPX files. So this is, I guess, my process for like at least getting a quick snapshot of everything that's in there. Obviously, fine, we'll return a ton of stuff, but you can kind of narrow this down and prune it down and look for interesting things if you wanted to. Oh, <laughs> whoops, I accidentally like pasted whatever I was searching. There is a web.config, and that is usually something worthwhile to look at. So let me go ahead and cat out that web.config, and bat is giving us the nice... Uh, color-coded output, and there is a lot of configuration stuff for Umbraco and Umbraco. Um, image processor, config, Umbraco settings config. We could save that, maybe took a, take a look at that one if we wanted to. What else do we have in here? App settings. Connection strings, ooh, 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 ooh. Yeah, is this thing gonna use it like a database? Umbraco DB database DSN. Whoa, what just happened? Why'd it bring me to the top of the file? Did I lose that? Did I just lose what I was looking at? There we go. Umbraco DB DSN. What is that DSN? Connection string with instance of Umbraco DSN. So that's definitely the database. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and that might be where it normally stores like a database and password. So since we're looking at hack the box, right, there's no other box that it's going to like reach out and connect to. This isn't going to be a full-blown network. It's going to data source, data directory, umbraco.sdf. Ooh. Is it a local file or it's storing the database? What is this umbraco sdf thing? You can see some of my previous research. Is it just like a, a local database? SDF file. 
Spatial data file is a single user geo database file format developed by Autodesk. I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's the same thing I'm looking at. Standard database format. That sounds a little bit more like what I'm looking at. Do I have that file? These are variables, data source, data directory, I think. I guess I can just look for this Umbraco SDF. So let me find and grep for that guy. See what I have here. Please get a hit. Please, please, please. Okay, app data Umbraco to SDF. If I file that guy, what is it gonna tell me? Data, incredible, fantastic. That's super duper useful. Um, just strings it, dude. Let's see if we get anything interesting in that. Ooh, yeah. Okay. Oh, this file's ginormous. Oh, and these are all like the blog posts and ooh, the products. Nice, crazy people. Heck yeah. Let me let me less this. Let's see what we got. Ooh, right at the top. Administrator, admin, default, en user or us. Some GUID, GUID, G-U-I-D, administrator, admin, and that looks like a hash. Yeah, and then it specifies hash algorithm SHA-1. Whoa. Okay, and that's repeated a little bit. So this looks like a potential hash. We could slap this in our readme. NFS share found... Uh, app data umbraco.sdf. Can I crack that hash? It's a SHA-1 hash. Uh, crack station. Yeah, yeah, yeah like crack, crack hash online, please. <laughs> and that's totally the definition of crack station. Slap that in there. Fail at a captcha. Bacon and cheese. Fantastic. For the admin user, right? And that had, that had his email in here. It's uh, admin being his username and admin at htb.local looks like an email address. So can I log in with that? Bacon and cheese. Ooh, nice. Yeah, yeah. Okay, logged in. What can I do with this? Media, settings, developer, developer? Does that let me do anything? Wait, is there any like, is there anything that like already does this? If I search exploit for Umbraco, am I gonna find anything? Remote code execution with Metasploit. Metasploit? Is that a thing that'll work? Oh, wait, authenticated remote code execution is just as easily. What's that guy? Nito didn't find anything else. So let's use Metasploit to search for that. See if it works. Upload ASPX. Will that do it? What do I got to know? It doesn't need like a username though. That's kind of weird to me. Will it just do it? I'm gonna set my L host to my adapter and then I'll just set the R host to 10, 10, 10 and 180 and just fire the thing off. Execution failed. Okay, whatever. What was that other one? There was a there was a search exploit other one that I saw. Um, Braco. Goodness, goodness, large terminal size. Make sure you guys can see this thing. Search exploit tack M, this guy. Um, yeah, I'll just bring it to the current directory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For this thing. Umbraco remote code execution by authenticated administrators. That's me. Login password host. <laughs> it's just forgetting a, uh, a uh, closing quotation. That's funny. So we have admin at htb.local and we have bacon and cheese and our host is 10101080. Will this just do it? 
what is it going to do? Launch the attack? What what code does it run? Am I going to get like command execution? Execute a calc for the POC. I don't really want that. Can I like ping myself? What's my IP address? Just to see if this thing would work. IP ADR. Yeah. That's me. Slap in my address. And let's stop GoBuster because you don't really need to do that. And then let's sudo. Can I TCP dump? Like attack L I ton zero and then look for ICMP. Yeah, I need to specify sudo for that. That's fine. So I just want to get like a proof of concept to see if this thing will actually execute that code. So let me Python three that four thing guy. Oh, that needs to have the HTTP schema. It looks like, yeah. How about now? Did it do it or did I do something wrong? Mm. Okay, that's fine, whatever. I guess we will put that away. We'll search Blake one last time to see what that last thing was. SEO checker plugin. Oh, it's just cross-site scripting. No, no, no. Let's do a simple Umbraco exploit search. Oh, no, Raj has one. Authenticated remote code execution. That is the exact same thing that we just saw. This one looks good. Umbraco authenticated RCE. Oh, and you can just pass stuff right through it. So that'd be really easy. You specify commands. What does this thing do? Some advisories on a packet storm. A little bit more robust uh, script here. Some arg parse. This looks like a modified and better version of the thing that we were just looking at. So the payload is using some XML and XSL to invoke a process. Yeah, oh yeah, it's just running C sharp through it. Okay, let's try that guy. It's a Git repository, so I'm gonna go ahead and Git clone this and Let's try to head over there and run this exploit. I need the username. So attack you admin at http.local. Password was bacon and cheese. Uh, IP address 10, 10, 10, 180. And then the C for the command to run. I'll just do like a simple who am I, get a proof of concept. Oh, that also needs the HTTP prefix. You can tell kind of just by that Python error, like we're missing the schema. See if that gets anything. It does. <laughs> okay, so can I do that ping one more time just to kind of like verify? Uh, I'm 1427, is that right? Oh, uh, what is that doing? Why did that fail? Did that fail? Unrecognized arguments. Oh, the help says I need to specify tack A to note to note some args. Okay. So let's fire that off. And there's the ping. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, so now what? We have code execution, right? Uh, we should probably like take note of this simple thing in our in our in our notes here. Let's see if we can get a reverse shell. This is a Windows box, right? I could probably run like system info. Yeah, and all this output is coming through. That's awesome. Windows box. 
x64 processor it's good to know the architecture so can i get a reverse shell um, on Windows, you might need to do a little bit more clever things because it's not as easy as just running Bash. Uh, if you want to do a PowerShell reverse shell, Nashang is pretty awesome to do that. Nashang is a framework in collecting of scripts and payloads that enables the use of PowerShell for offensive security, pen testing, and red teaming. There is a PowerShell reverse shell that this thing has, and that is in the shells folder here. And there's an invoke PowerShell tcp.ps1. Uh, it's pretty decent PowerShell code with a lot of actual description and documentation as to what the heck the thing is doing. There's an example syntax here. So we could work with that. If you don't have that downloaded, you can get clone it. You can work with it. I am going to copy that from my op directory. It's in shells. And then I have that invoke PowerShell tcp.ps1. I'll put that here. And then I'll modify that script. There's no like good, uh, I don't think there's like a PowerShell display or color scheme in Sublime Text, which is annoying. But we have this example here. So what this is gonna essentially allow us to do, and wow, that's just really hard to look at. Can I cat that? Does Bat know how to work with that thing? Yeah, okay, good. So at the end of all this, all this puts together is building out the functionality to use that syntax. Like you would be able to run this and it would create all these functions that you could use or bind these commandlets for you. Uh, so what we wanna do is at the very, very end actually execute this. So we could just stage this thing to fire off the reverse shell as we need to. I know my IP address was 10, 10, 14, 27 and the port number quad four is totally fine to work with. So let's set up a little web server, python tacm http.server, let that go. And we have our invoke PowerShell TCP in the same directory as we're starting the web server. So I could start my netcat listener to get ready for this thing. And then I can try and fumble with the syntax of actually getting this thing to start. So, Tax C will let me work with a command. So let's run PowerShell. And then we have tack A to pass in arguments. I'll make this a little bit easier to read. So I could simply be like echo, like hello, or please sub, just to get a proof of concept that I'm running PowerShell. Oh, and I need to be in that correct directory where that uh, exploit script actually is. So, okay, we get that output, good sanity check. Now I want to run IEX or invoke expression. So I would be able to run commands from a string. So if I were to try and do that once again, echo please sub following the IEX, this echo is going to come out into kind of standard output. And then IEX will just execute please sub as if it were a command. In this case, obviously there is no command please sub. So that tells me that that syntax might work so now I'll go ahead and create a new object. And this is gonna allow me to do some Windows stuff, PowerShell stuff, to get a web client object, which has the function download string. And that way I could give it my IP address, 10, 10, 10, 14, 27, on that port 8000 and download and run because of this IEX, all that string is gonna be pulled in and then executed, invoke, PowerShell tcp.ps1. So ideally, we'll see this web server, see the request for that invoke PowerShell tcp. The victim and target will run that code. And then over on the other side here, I'll see my reverse shell come through. So if I whack the enter button, hopefully we'll get some magic and we do. Now I am on that box. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So I can do a little who am I? And it looks like I am this weird IIS user, that's fine. Let me go to the root of the directory, root of the uh, file system here, and let's see if I could snag that user flag. Let me check public, there it is. I can run cat because I'm in PowerShell, so there is that user flag. And I can't easily clear my screen. <laughs> so we'll just pretend you didn't see that, who cares. Uh, next, 
we'll want to try to do some enumeration and potentially privesque, do our privilege escalation. So a really good way to do this is to run WinPs or some of the privilege escalation awesome scripts. I'll just search for WinPs and Carlos Polyp. I think I'm butchering pronunciation as always, so forgive me. Awesome Windows privilege escalation tools for Windows and Linux. So you've seen me run LinPs probably all the time on Linux stuff, but WinPs is also really good to work with. They have a batch script rendition of it, uh, and I've seen that fumble for me. I don't know if it's because it's just slow to return or just didn't execute, but uh, the exe file is kind of really what we would love to work with. Uh, if I actually go into this here, you note know, there's a solution file for like actually getting the, the source code and stuff for working with it within Visual Studio and compiling the thing, but they do offer under bin in this path here, they also offer releases and an x86 x or x86 release. So you literally have the executable file you could download and work with. I've tried to click on this and like download it raw. And then I've had my browser yell at me because Chrome would be like, hey, this is dangerous. Or Firefox would be like, hey, this, this file is potentially malicious. With that in mind, um, this reverse shell that we did trying to run that invoke PowerShell TCP, might get triggered by Windows Defender sometimes. I mean, most often if that sort of thing is on, right? So you might not always be able to do this specific thing. And in our hack the box learning environment, we can totally do that. I'm just gonna go ahead and download this with curl, I guess. So I will copy that link address and I will close my silly meterpreter session because I don't need that anymore. And let's get back to my hack the box YouTube remote file folder here. Let me go ahead and download this. So I'll wget winps.exe or you probably already have that repository clone and you can just move it in here. Uh, note that this is the 64-bit version. I pulled that one down specifically because we saw in our system info command, that's the same architecture for this victim. That's just kind of a, a, a good thing to do. I think the 32-bit one you can usually trust, but uh, anyway, we've got that. So now I actually want to download this file. So I'm going to go back into my reverse shell of the victim and actually let me mark that as black so you kind of know there's some distinction here. Uh, I'll move into a temporary directory. I'll move into C Windows temp and there's some stuff in here now but I don't particularly care about it. It actually probably has sold some of my <laughs> remnants of previously working on it so let's kill those. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Removing the fourth wall. And let's let's try and pull this down into this box. We still have our HTTP web server running so we could transfer files just as easily. Earlier we did this download string. I think there's a download file one as well, but you also just have the kind of classic PowerShell invoke web request. And my face is gonna be in the way and I can't clear the screen. So let me make that go away. Invoke web request to download from my IP address 10, 10, 10, 14, 27, port 8000, winps.exe. I can pull this down, but it kind of doesn't know what to do with it. So the best thing for us to do is actually bring that to a file. And you can pass that with that invoke web request uh, tack out file argument. So HTTP 1427 win peas and I'll specify that tack out file location and I'll just call it like win peas.exe keep the file name here good that's downloaded now if I ls I should have this file here fantastic so we could simply run this if we were in cmd.exe uh, you wouldn't need to specify the dot slash since we are in powershell we should to be able to run that out of the current directory so while whack that winps.exe, give that just a second and hopefully, hopefully, hopefully it will come back with something and it did. Okay. Fantastic. What do we got here? You could of course do this manual enumeration if you really wanted to. Ooh, that also isn't giving me a full like scroll back. Dislike. Uh, could I download this? trying to think of a decent way to be able to pull this back down to the victim. You know what? 
I think a good thing to do would actually just be get a interpreter shell in here because that would just kind of make kind of our our control a little bit easier. So I like to just use some of the interpreter cheat sheets or MSF Venom to be able to craft that and, and create that. Uh, NetSec has a really, really good one that I always reference because it helps me not think. <laughs> and uh, it just will give me the quick and easy payload. I know it's easy, a oh, Windows Meterpreter reverse TCP, but I always fumble with like the architecture and whether or not I need to specify that. So I will steal this command and I'll get back to my sublime text just so I can kind of... Uh, have a window to tinker with this command. My IP address needs to be filled in here, 1427, and we'll listen on, I guess, quad six. There we go, and we'll call this like meterpreter.exe. Good, good, good. Whack that out. That will go ahead and create a prepackaged binary and download, like, actual program that we could run, put on the host, put on the victim, and then have it call back to our own interpreter shell. So let me MSF console this guy so I can prepare the handler, like the listener that'll be able to catch this reverse shell. And then we still have our HTTP server running down here. I'll use exploit multi handler. And I will show options as a sanity check the things that I need to change. We do need to set our L host to ourselves. We do need to set our L port to our port that we wanted to listen on. And we should set the payload to the same thing that we told MSF Venom to use. So I will set payload to that guy. And now I can run and start up that listener. So back over in our victim, because we have just that simple meterpreter.exe file ready to download in the same directory, what I'll do is I'll once again use that invoke web request to download this guy. Invoke web request, my IP. And save that to a file. We'll just call it met.exe, good. Kinda zooming out here, I do have this met.exe Good, so my meterpreter shell should be all set and ready to catch that. So if I were to dot slash met, you can see that meterpreter session one opened up on the top here. Fantastic. Now I can upload and download things a little bit easily and that might be convenient for actually checking out the rest of that uh, WinP's enumeration script. Let me go ahead and check out my current directory. I'm still in the temporary file, so I will actually use this shell to be able to run winps.exe one more time, and I'll save it to like winout.log. And hopefully when I get my prompt back, that will behave for me. Good. Now I can download that winout.log because that's in the current directory and meterpreter is the one that has that download command. I wouldn't be able to kind of easily do that on the victim without being able to like spin up an HTTP server or netcat or file transfer. So meterpreter just kind of makes that nice and, and easy for me. So now let me go ahead and less tack r that uh, winout file. Yep, that's totally fine. Yes. Do I actually have content in that? Oh boy. Did it just do it? It did just do it. Does that not want to work? Can I cat winout.log? Okay, sure. <laughs> that works just fine for me and Bat will handle it. Now I can actually read through all the stuff that the WinPiece gave me. Uh, it would probably have just been smarter and better to have an actual scroll back on here or use tmux or a better thing that will help me actually view the output of, but that was just some quick problem solving to be able to see the rest of this. And it's good to have meterpreter on there. Ooh, Windows Vuln search powered by Watson. Looks like this has a lot of stuff that could potentially be vulnerable for. User environment variables, computer name is remote. Username is remote. System environment variable, stuff that we've seen before. Uh, 
LSA protection. No AV was detected. That's probably why we were able to totally run uh, Meterpreter and a reverse shell. Normally, you wouldn't see that happen on a Windows target. PowerShell stuff. Drives information. Do, 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 do. Current token privileges. Maybe we could tinker with some of those. SEM impersonate privilege. Ooh. Would that be an option? Some auto login credentials were found. Oh, just the default username for administrator. Okay. Nothing huge. Interesting processes. Yep, there's PowerShell. I invoked that. <laughs> Met.exe. I invoked that. That's our interpreter. WinPs, I invoked that. Okay, all the in interesting stuff seemingly is just me. Services information, interesting services, non-Microsoft. Uh, OpenSSH, TeamViewer. Ooh, whoa, and that's just running? Oh, come on. I don't need less, I don't need your help. I was just looking at TeamViewer and it, it moved away from me. I can search for it again. TeamViewer, there we go. So if we did our actual like own manual enumeration, like if we went over to CDC and the C drive, you could probably hop over to like the program files and see if there's anything that sticks out to you, any particular uh, programs or software that might be installed. Don't forget to take a look in the other program files directory, program files, x86, slap that guy in there and you should see team viewer. So that's kind of interesting and peculiar. Um, not, something that's installed by default, right? Not native to Windows. Um, so maybe a thought, considering this box is called remote and TeamViewer is supposed to be a remote access and uh, availability thing, uh, tool and program and software. I wonder if there are any logs or any information for that TeamViewer application. We could hop over there and start to explore things if we really wanted to. We could deep dive into it. Um, but because we have Meterpreter on here, because we have Metasploit running, and I don't have a ton of shame, I don't have any issue in running Metasploit, uh, maybe there's a module that will be able to search and look for TeamViewer credentials. So TeamViewer, Metasploit, there is a Windows Gather TeamViewer passwords seemingly module. This module will find and decrypt stored TeamViewer passwords. Incredible. <laughs> so our Meterpreter session, let's go ahead and hit back or background on that. So we get back to a regular MSF or MSF console shell. And then let's search for that team viewer and see, it looks like we do have a post module, post Windows gather credentials, team viewer passwords. Let's check that out. So I'll use that and show options to see what we got to supply here. We do need the session for what we're actually working with. And if we were to check out our sessions, we have our one session of Meterpreter here on the victim. So let me set session to just one and then fire that off. Immediately it finds this unattended password for remote. Awesome. And I spent a decent amount of time now trying to figure out like, okay, how do I connect to TeamViewer uh, with this unattended setup? Can I just connect to it as an IP address and, and, and do things with it? I didn't really get anywhere with that. Uh, and then I eventually just kind of thought like, well, this is a password, right? And potential password reuse is a thing. So maybe this would be someone else's password, but I didn't see any other users on this box other than really just the administrator himself. And then I kind of put some of the puzzle pieces together. We saw in our Rust scan output or from our Nmap searching that we actually have WinRM on here, that port that we saw earlier. So maybe I could try this password for that administrator user. So I could save this if I wanted to, slap it in our readme, but let's go ahead and try to use evil WinRM to connect to it. If you aren't familiar with evil WinRM or you haven't seen it before, you can totally go download it. It's the WinRM shell that you could use for hacking and penetration testing. Typically, it's just good to get access on a box if you see that 
Windows Remote Management or WinRM on a target on Windows. Uh, pretty simple, needs tack I for an IP address and a user and password you could pass along. It can also do some pass the hash stuff, which is very, very cool. And I want to get smarter on this. I need to learn and tinker with it a little bit more. But let's go ahead and do it. Let's use evil WinRM on that IP address with the user being administrator and with the password being tack P. And I'm gonna have to specify single quotes here because these exclamation points might make bash choke or whine. So let's whack that. And it connected. So we are currently in the administrator's documents and we are the administrator. So we could check out what we have here over in his desktop DIR. Looks like we have that root.txt. Uh, can I run wctacl? L? Will, will PowerShell know what that means? No? Get or like measure object, I think. I can actually cure, uh, clear this screen, so that's handy. Measure object root.txt, does that work? We could just cat the thing out, but that is, uh, I don't, seriously, now I just kind of want to know. Measure object PowerShell. I am earning PowerShell. I guess I would have to cat it out. Yeah, so cat root dot text and then pipe it to measure object. You can't just pass it the file name. Incredible. Can I get the line, please? How about characters? <laughs> Character or car? Character. 32 characters. So we know it's a hash and I'm not spoiling anything by showcasing the root dot text when I've already showcased the user dot text. Anyway, that's that. That is the remote box. Uh, this was a lot of fun for me because it's Windows and I need to stretch myself and do more Windows boxes and Windows machines. Um, I have a lot to learn there and it's all about the learning process. So this has been kind of fun. I know it's an easy box and that's how it's kind of rated, but that's still something that I enjoy and have a good time with. And there's always some kind of cool tools and things to learn working with that. So holy cow, I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, we did some really nifty stuff doing some, I don't know, Umbraco looking for things and enumerating and NTFS shares or NFS shares, sorry. Um, mounting those and exploring those and pillaging even with simple strings and okay then using some code execution uh, to get access to the box pulling in some winps to do enumeration and finding passwords with team view or metasploit so there's a lot of a lot of stuff going on but wow Thanks so much for watching, everybody. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do do the YouTube algorithm things. I would love to see maybe a quick like in the video, a silly comment down at the bottom. I don't care. Uh, YouTube algorithm stuff. Please subscribe. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching, everybody. I'll see you in the next video. Take care. Love you. Yeah.